Hello everyone, today I'm going to talk about Zook 256 and spectral analysis tools for cryptanalysis. My name is Alexander Maximov and I am from Ericsson Research, residing in the city of Lund in Sweden. This work was done together with Ying Yang and Thomas Johansson from Lund University. I will first make a short introduction to the Zook algorithm. Then I will sketch for a linear distinguishing attack on Zook. Afterwards, I will make a dive into spectral analysis tools for cryptanalysis. Zook is a domestic stream cipher that is used in 4G mobile networks. It was developed and used mainly in China. The 128-bit key version was standardized by 3GPP in 2011. Currently, there is an ongoing work in 3GPP on 256-bit key algorithms for use in 5G and beyond. So the Zook design team proposed to use exactly the same design, but with a longer 256-bit key and a 184-bit IV. The new version of Zook was presented at Eurocrypt RAMP session in 2018, and there was a follow-up workshop on the algorithm. Zook has the Linear Feedback Shift Register, LFSR, and the Final State Machine, FSM, and it produces 32 bits of key stream each clock. The LFSR operates in the prime field modulo 2 to the power 31 minus 1, while the FSM is constructed over GF2 to the power 32. There is a bit reorganization layer that mixes bits of the LFSR and pushes down 32-bit words to the FSM, denoted as X terms in the figure. It is a bit difficult to analyze Zook because of mixed field arithmetic, so standard cryptanalysis methods are not so easy to apply. But in this work, we found the first, to the best of our knowledge, academic attack, which is faster than exhaustive key search. It is a linear distinguishing attack of complexity 2 to the power 236, which indicates that the keystream generator of Zook does not provide the full 256-bit entropy. I would like to stress that in 5G settings, that attack is not an immediate threat, so it is just a pure academic result. We start our linear analysis of Zook by finding a way to overcome the bit reorganization layer. Assume we found a four-weight polynomial multiple, such that the equation 1 uh, on the slides uh, holds over the LFSR's prime field. The degree of that polynomial is expected to be around 2 to the power 167, based on the birthday paradox. Then for each 32-bit uh, X term constructed by the bit reorganization layer, we can get the equation under two parallel 16-bit additions that is almost true, but with some 32-bit carry noise C. For example, if we consider the signal X1, then that equation would look like as it is shown in the green box. We then found a theoretical result, basically saying that if we take S values in the equation 1 and extract any consecutive T bits from this S values, then the sum of those sub values truncated by T bits would generate a random carry with only possible values 0 or plus minus 1. And probabilities of these values are the same for any sub bits that we extract from those S values. As the consequence in the red box, we then conclude on the distribution of the 32-bit carry noise C. The lower and higher 16-bit values of C are independent, and they have the same distribution, such that the probability of 0 is 2 thirds, and uh, for other two values plus minus 1, the probability is uh, 1 over 6. Now, when we found the cancellation rule on X terms, we can proceed with approximation of the finite state machine. Consider the expressions for two consecutive key stream words. It's clear that two words should be enough to approximate the FSM, where on one side there will be a noise, and on the other side there will be X terms. However, we can use the above cancellation rule on X terms and derive the total noise, 
while including the cancellation rule on axis directly into the noise expression and it gives a larger bias overall. That idea can be used in analysis of other stream ciphers as well. In our attack, we chose a straightforward form of the sampling equation given in the yellow box and there the attacker only needs to choose a single binary masking matrix M. As a result, we took a simple form of sampling which is then equal to the biased noise expression. We found the masking matrix M that effectively made the bias of the total noise be 2 to the power minus 236. We actually use squared Euclidean imbalance for the bias computation. It means also that the complexity of a distinguishing attack is 1 over the bias. This way we achieved an academic attack on Zook that is 2 to the power 20 times faster than exhaustive key search. There are only two problems remaining as noted in the green box. The first problem is how to compute those 32-bit noise distributions for N1 and N2 noise variables, the ex exact expressions for which will be given on the next slide. And the second problem is how did we actually found um, that linear masking matrix M that gave us the large bias of the total noise. Here we have complete expressions for 32-bit noise noises N1 and N2, where N1 is furthermore split into the sum of two sub-noises N1A and N1B, just simply because they use different uh, random uh, variables. Without going into details, these three sub-noises are basically approximations of arithmetical additions into XORs plus those C carry noise noises involved in the approximation of X terms. If we take, for example, N1A, N1A, a naive way to construct that distribution would require a very huge loop of size around 2 to the power 553, which is totally computationally infeasible. However, we can utilize a modified bit slicing uh, technique so that we could compute the distribution of this noise variables in time around 2 to the power of 47. I would like to skip the details of the bit slicing technique and would rather refer to the full paper for this. So the second problem that is more interesting was to find the matrix M such that the total bias of the noise expression is maximized. And this we can do with spectral analysis techniques. So in the next part of this presentation I will mainly speak about spectral analysis tools for cryptanalysis. In cryptanalysis we often have to deal with multidimensional expressions for noise variables. It is fair to say that multidimensional approximations give larger biases than binary approximations just because of a multidimensional distribution contains more information than just a single bit of it. So assume we have n bit alphabet uh, like 32-bit alphabet, pr for example, and we have t random variables x1, x2, and so on. An n-bit distribution table of a random variable x can be converted to the frequency domain by using either uh, FDFT or walsh hadamard transform, depending on operations that we will later want to do with that spectrum. That conversion can be done efficiently in time uh, big N log big N by utilizing fast algorithms. So in case of 32-bit expressions, it is 2 to the power 32 times 32. The values of the spectral table can be positive and negative, but note that the first value in position 0 is equal to 1, which is the sum of all probabilities of the distribution table in the time domain. In case the original distribution table was not normalized, then that value in the spectrum position 0 will serve as a normalization factor. So why spectral analysis is so interesting and what we can actually do there in the frequency domain? 
In the frequency domain, we can compute the bias of a noise variable in such a way that even very small biases can be handled efficiently without the need for long number arithmetics. In the expression for the total noise, we often see an arithmetical sum or an XOR of two or more noise variables, so we can compute convolutions of such noise distributions efficiently in the frequency domain, and it is in linear time instead of quadratic complexity in the time domain. We can also use spectral analysis for approximations of S-boxes, and not only the small ones, but also large composite S-boxes as well. And we can also search for a good linear masking in the frequency domain that would result in a large bias of the total noise in the end. So spectral tools are very powerful and very interesting methods for cryptanalysis. Let's have a look how the bias can be computed in the frequency domain. So we compute the bias as a squared Euclidean imbalance, as shown in the above first formula. When the bias is defined in such a way, then a distinguisher would need around 1 over the bias number of samples in order to distinguish that source of noise from random. This way, if the expected bias is, for example, 2 to the power minus 512, then in the time domain we have to use float numbers with precision at least 256 bits. This means we have to use large number arithmetic, which in turn takes a lot of RAM and computation time. Let's again have a look on the right picture with the values in the frequency domain. We have shown that in the frequency domain, the bias is actually the sum of those red boxes at all non-zero locations, but each red value should be taken into power of 2. The zero point value is again a normalization factor. The consequence of this observation is that in order to handle small biases in the frequency domain, we only need a few bits of precision, but the exponent field should be there and it should be preserved. So the standard C type double wo works very well for storing the spectrum of a noise distribution, even if the bias is very small, so we don't need to use a long number arithmetic in the frequency domain. Then having two or more spectrums of noise distributions, we can actually perform a convolution of those noise variables. So that corresponds to the expression where we do an arithmetical addition or XOR of those noises. The resulting spectrum is achieved by point-to-point -point multiplication of the spectrums of the original noise distributions. This way, for example, we can compute the bias of an XOR of two noise variables in the spectrum domain without having to switch back to the time domain. Recall that there we need float numbers with high precision. However, an important observation here is that the convolution is a point-wise multiplication of the input spectrum vectors, so that the largest bias of the result will be achieved if there would be a red box in the resulting spectrum that would have a very high absolute peak value. So the peak values in the spectrum will contribute the most to the total bias. So let's take a simple case when we have only two noise variables and we want to sum them together. If we take the first noise variable and find a way how to rotate or shuffle its spectrum such that the largest red boxes of the first and the second noise distributions match in some non-zero location, then the sum or convolution of these two noise variables will result in a large bias. Because of the peak values are now synchronized and the product of them contributes as a large noise in their result. This observation can be used for searching good linear masks and uh, this motivates us to develop spectral tools for crypt cryptanalysis fuser on. So consider the general case when we have t and bit noise variables x1, x2 and so on and we want to find the sequence of linear matrices m1, m2, and so on, each of size n times n bits, such that the sum expression above would result in a new noise variable x that would have a very large bias. 
So we found the, how the matrix multiplication in the time domain affects the spectrum in the frequency domain and this result can be used as the basis for an algorithm that can find the spectrum peaks in each of those noise distributions of x1, x2 and so on and then the algorithm will construct such M matrices so that those peak values in those subspectrums will be shifted and aligned in certain spectrum points and this way it will result in large bias of the total sum of these sub-noises. We also found a similar technique for uh, discrete Fourier transform case where the sum of noise variables is actually an arithmetical addition truncated by n bits but here instead of searching for binary matrices we need to search for odd n bit coefficients and then we do in our best in order to get a large possible bias of the resulting sum. We didn't go much deeper with DFT cases since we couldn't use <coughs> these results for took uh, cryptanalysis but we sort of sketched the general way forward in DFT cases as well. <coughs> Spectral techniques can also be used for an analysis and approximation of S boxes. Normally there are small sizes sized as boxes which are then combined with uh, linear transformation transformations so that we get a large composite S box. For example in SUC we have 32-bit S boxes composed by first applying a 32-bit linear transformation then four 8-bit parallel S boxes to individual bytes of the 32-bit input word. In SNOW 3G it is vice versa. First use we use four 8-bit S boxes, then afterwards we apply a linear combination matrix on the 32 bit word. So, in general, we can say that such composite S boxes can be generalized as a matrix R times parallel smaller S boxes on the product of another matrix Q times the input X. An approximation of such a composite S box would then be a binary matrix M times the input X. The question here is how to find the approximation matrix M such that the approximation would give us a large bias uh, of the noise. We started our analysis from usual smaller S-boxes and we found how an approximation matrix M of such an S-box would affect the spectrum of the approximation noise. The case point of the spectrum of such an approximation by the matrix M times the input X can be expressed as another point lambda equal to K times M of the spectrum of the case vector B that is in turn associated and constructed from the given S box and the index K. So we know where we want to move the highest peak it is location k in the spectrum and we know where the highest peak is currently located it is lambda then we derive the matrix m to make this happen this is the central idea of the spectral analysis to be able to move high red boxes into a wanted spectrum position and this way we learn how to align multiple noise spectrums and get a large overall bias in the end for small S boxes, we can basically um, pre-compute all possible uh, values for different K and the uh, different uh, lambdas. So, for example, for 8-bit S boxes, that would cost us uh, that would be that would have a complexity 2 to the power 19, which is still doable. So, but moreover, we will use that uh, these observations to to handle large composite S boxes in a very efficient way, as follows. So we also found that if a composite S box is simply a vector of t smaller sub S boxes, then the spectrum point lambda of the case vector B of such a large S box would be simply equal to the product of corresponding spectrum points of smaller B vectors of individual sub S boxes. So that if for each sub S box we precompute all possible spectrum values for the pairs of K and lambda, then the spectral probing of the large composite S box is very simple it is simply computed by T table lookups and T minus 1 multiplications 
let me give an example how this all may be used. Uh, so for all basic S boxes like S0 and S1 in TUC, we precompute lookup tables that contain spectrum values for all pairs K and lambda. Then assume the composite S box is expressed as a number of linear transformations R and Q applied in between the parallel sub S boxes. And uh, we will approximate that composite S box by a large matrix M times X. Then for any spectrum point K of the approximation noise of such a composite S box, we derive intermediate indices K prime and lambda prime. Then the spectrum value of the composite S box approximation or the noise variable at the point K will be then the product of subspectrum points in corresponding lookup tables that we have precomputed earlier. So this is a very efficient way to probe the spectrum of a composite S box without actually having to construct the spectrum itself. Coming back to the final step of Zug analysis, recall the expression for the total noise as above in the first bullet. We will try to align peak values of sub noises in some position k in the spectrum. Then the expression for the spectrum value of the total noise in the location k can be expressed as given in the second bullet. So we then need to search for a pair k and lambda where the product of those uh, spectrum values is maximized and thus achieving a large uh, bias of the, of the total noise. Note that the involved variables are 32 bit long. So we cannot really make an exhaustive loop on k and lambda as it would be then 2 to the power 64. However, we can use the spectrum of the noise N1 to search for promising candidates of lambdas and where the spectrum values are the largest. Then we can also search through, through the spectrum of the noise N2 for candidates of the index k. We then do an exhaustive search over all pairs k and lambda from the two lists of promising candidates and compute the complete spectrum value of the total noise for each pair k and lambda. For probing the S-box approximations, we utilize the results from the previous slide and do it efficiently in a constant time by using a number of small lookup tables. When the best pair K and lambda is found, then uh, we then construct the matrix M such that lambda is exactly equal to K times M. Note that here we can actually synchronize 32 largest spectrum peaks with the same matrix M, but then in this case all K indices and the lambda indices must be linearly independent. In the end, we verified our results by applying the derived matrix M and performing the construction of complete distribution tables of the S-box approximations and other involved noise distributions. The result confirmed that we actually got a distinguishing attack on SUC of complexity around 2 to the power 236, which is faster than exhaustive key search. We think that presented spectral Techniques may also be useful in analysis of other algorithms, not only stream ciphers, but also block ciphers. We believe there could be other improvements to our results and we encourage future research on these topics. Thank you all for your attention and listening to my talk.